Welcome to HDB Agronomy Week 2020. The live stream session will start shortly. Before we begin, we wanted to remind you of a few points of housekeeping. You're all on mute, so don't worry, we can't hear you. The session is scheduled to last between one and one and a half hours, including questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions throughout the session using the live Q&A function in the Agronomy Week platform below. We're recording this session, so if you miss anything or would like to watch it again, it will be available on the HDB YouTube channel and HDB website. You can also come back and watch the recordings on the Agronomy Week platform for three months. At the end of the session, we'll provide you with unique basis and Neuroso codes. Don't forget to complete the basis and Neuroso forms using the relevant tabs on the platform. You have two weeks after the live session to register for your points. Join in the conversation online. Follow AHDB underscore cereals and AHDB underscore potatoes on Twitter and use the hashtag Agronomy Week. If you have any issues with the conference platform, there are digital event FAQs in the menu on the left hand side. You can use the help tab to contact the team if you experience any technical problems during the week. We hope that you enjoy Agronomy Week 2020. Thanks for joining us. Your session will now start. Well, a warm welcome to everybody joining us at this web event today. This event comes to as part of the AHDB 2020 Agronomy Week. And for the next hour and a half, we will be focusing on the topic of cover crops, rotations and niche cropping, discussing strategies that are outside the usual box and can be beneficially integrated as part of an arable cropping strategy. So to plant a profit. My name is Paul Hill and I represent the Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board in the South East as their Arable Knowledge Exchange Manager. I will be hosting these proceedings with the help of Fiona Geary, who will be quietly and efficiently working behind the scene to collate all, the, all your questions in order to ensure I can efficiently get through as many of them in the time we have available. Relatable AHDB publications will be shown during this presentation, as well as being found by scrolling down to the bottom of the screen. Here you will also find a new update version of the AHDB Arable Review, which will give you additional information with regards to the current research projects being undertaken by the AHDB. With regards to your questions and thoughts, in order to keep things flowing this evening, the plan is to undertake the majority of your questions to the speakers after they have both completed their presentations. So please feel free to send your questions in via the question and answer function, which again is found by scrolling down the main screen. Obviously, I will do my best to put as many of your questions to the panel within the time we have. However, this is obviously depends on how many questions we receive. If we do not have, uh, if we do have uh, some uh, some questions unanswered, we will try and ensure that these are answered and released as an attachment to the meeting recording. So, quickly to the agenda. We will shortly start with Stephen Briggs, who I'll introduce shortly. Stephen will be focusing on the topic of our agroforestry, discussing how this can be beneficially utilised and integrated into a serial operation. We will then move we will then move our focus towards beneficial rotations with Jake Freestone, who will be discussing the cropping strategies that he undertakes in order to promote the health, robustness and profitability of his main cash crops. But before we move on, I would like to get your interaction and thoughts uh, with this poll question. And the poll question, as you can see, is up there. Are trees an important factor in helping, uh, in helping um, farm businesses achieve future economic sustainability? Um, you've got four answers there. Um, to poll, you will need to scroll down further the, down the page where you will see a button. By pressing on this, you'll be able to cast your vote so please um, find that button and uh, join in with this. Um, but while you're actually casting your vote, I'd just lightly, I'd like to quickly highlight why this topic we are discussing this evening is of such importance. 
So as agronomists, it's vital you recognise the many challenges that agricultural businesses are facing. And like it or not, these challenges will certainly influence the way farms need to operate in the coming years. Therefore, innovative thinking is now an obligation if you want to continue to keep crops healthy, vigorous and economically viable, as well as ensuring the husbandry implemented meets the present and future statutory regulations and compliances. Focusing on farm economics, we should all keep reminding ourselves that Pillar 1 payments will begin to be reduced from next year. This will certainly put additional pressure on the financial robustness of many farm businesses. In 2028, we will be into a new era as direct payments would have come to an end. And when capital support is totally associated with the enhancement and protection of the environmental of the environment, together with its natural capital with the slogan of public money for public goods. At this point, the farm businesses you advise upon must have developed those opportunities that continue to promote crop health and vigour. But this will now have to be undertaken in a mutually beneficial partnership with the surrounding environment and the natural assets these, this possesses. By implementing this, it will ensure crop husbandry strategies remain sustainable. And as proved uh, from this graph that you're seeing, um, we need to look outside our usual toolbox. Um, it's becoming even more crucial as variable costs are generally only going one way. Therefore, in this ever extreme, in, uh, in this ever extreme uh, changing climate, we need to be much more proactive rather than reactive, recognizing the avenues that turn these challenges into sustainable opportunities. Therefore, tonight we will sow some ideas that can beneficially plant a profit. So before I, I go on to introduce our first presenter, let's just review the poll results. So from that, we can uh, see there's a lot of you undecided. Hopefully, from the uh, Stevens um, presentation tonight, we can uh, change your mind on things. Um, so we've got 47% on maybe, as you can see, 7% of you don't know, and we've got 33 saying yes and 13% saying no. So thank you for um, doing that and uh, involving yourself. So from that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Stephen, is a, Stephen Briggs is a first generation farmer and farm consultant. He's been farming organically in excess of 18 years, growing organic cereals plus some vegetables. In 2009, he planted 4,500 apple trees within his cropland to, great, to create the largest commercial silver arable system in the UK. From this, he makes and sells organic apple juice and in 2017 converted a farm building into a shop, cafe and education centre. Stephen's farm is also in higher level stewardship. Stephen is a past Nuffield scholarship, scholar where he studied agroforestry and how it can increase productivity. All of this fits in nicely with his main passion which is soils, and this has seen him undertake an MSc in soil science, as well as taking a leading role in soils for innovation for agriculture. So Stephen, welcome, a big welcome from, from all of us, and particularly from me. Uh, you've seen the poll, we've got uh, some convincing to do, but over to you. Thanks very much, Paul, and uh, evening to all. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some challenges ahead, but hopefully I can share over the next uh, few minutes, uh, share the sort of uh, some information on agroforestry and also uh, the journey we've taken on our own farm. So I'll just uh, I'll just start sharing uh, sharing my screen. Which not sure how we we do that. Um, there we go. Hopefully it should be coming up. No. Well, I'm going to. I was told to keep it on being shared, but it doesn't seem to be coming up, Paul. Yeah, I mean, uh, just have a retry, Stephen, and just see. Okay, I'll just I'll just share it again. Uh, right, bear with me one second. Um, apologies for this. 
while, while you're um, looking at that, obviously with that poll, Stephen, is that something that you thought was, um, you know, is that a surprise to you where that came on that, on those figures? No, I mean, you know, clearly people will have, um, will, will have their own views on how trees fit into their, into their farming business. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's not, that's not atypical from, from what I might expect to see. So, you know, for, for many farmers, the, the, the skill set that, um, uh, you will have, uh, as farmers might not, in, might not include, um, might not include trees and, or, or forestry. So actually making sure that you've got the right skill set is, is, you know, hugely important. We'll, we'll talk about that, uh. Uh, as we go what what uh, we'll do Stephen because obviously there's a few technical problems there yeah. um what I'll do and if Jake's happy with it we'll switch over the presentations and do Jake's first okay, just let, okay. Just, uh, apologies, yeah. just let me just try yeah. once more for some okay. reason when I was asked to keep it being shared it, it won't let me access to it but I'm just going to shut it down and try again Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, we'll go to Jake, I think, Stephen, and let you just sort that one out. Um, uh, so, I've got it now. I've got it now. Have you got it? Because my apologies. Hopefully, people can see that. Uh, can't see it at the uh, Something's coming up now. That's it. Brilliant, Stephen. Okay. Well done. Excellent. My apologies. Okay, so. Uh, as Paul introduced, hopefully you can see that now. Um, I, I have my own farming business in Cambridgeshire. I'm a, uh, a Nuffield farming scholar. Uh, I run a I run a private consultancy business since 2001, and I'm head of soils for innovation for agriculture. And actually, one of the things Paul said was that um, uh, uh, the background to everything we've been doing has has really been soil focused. And I, I did my masters in soil science some 27 years ago and that's really underpinned everything that we tried to do on, on, on the farm and within my sort of working career so what i'm going to do is cover you know sort of what agroforestry is what the policy directions are uh what some of the environmental benefits some of the productivity benefits and the economics and um different agroforestry options and then really share some experiences from my own farm uh, growing agroforestry on 125 acres or 52 hectares, which has been in place since 2009. So let's ask some questions to start with. Um, really, I suppose, is high input, high output, is, is that still fit for purpose going forward? Um, it, it, it has been fit for purpose, but, but is it still the right model to uh, uh, produce crops on go, going forward. Certainly, we know that inputs are becoming more expensive, and through legislation and uh, and um, uh, and also resistance, they're becoming less available in some situations. But we're also being asked to increase productivity, use resources better, and protect and enhance biodiversity. So there's a there's a lot of things we're being asked to do as as farmers. Um, in its most simplest form, and I'm sure Jake will pick up on the same themes, uh, as farmers, our job really is to, in its simplest form, is to capture sunlight and turn it into carbon, mix it with a bit of, car uh, of carbon dioxide and water, and that, you know, that's our job. And whether we're a farmer or whether we're a forester or indeed whether we're a photovoltaic PV engineer, our job is all the same in terms of capturing that sunlight. And, uh, and using it to, to uh, create, create things that we can sell. And this got me thinking a few years, well, more than a decade ago, that when we're talking about cereal production, at the point of the year when there's near maximum solar radiation during late July, August and September in our latitudes, we actually turn the solar panels off. During that period of year, we might be using the sun to dry crops in the field to harvest but but we're not building new carbon so at the point of the year when there we've got maximum sunlight maximum carbon building potential we've got nothing green growing and and that started, started me thinking about 
um, how we might be able to plug that gap and keep the solar panels turned on. Because if we can get more energy going in, we can, we can have more productivity overall. So I think it's widely recognised that uh, trees are important for climate change adaptation. Uh, they're the lungs of the planet. Uh, I started asking the question a decade or so ago, could trees have a role in agriculture? And could agroforestry be an alternative approach to the way we manage our land? Um, and, and that really was the subject of my Nuffield study a decade ago. So what is agroforestry? Well, simply put, it's where land use, uh, with land use where trees are combined with crops and or livestock on the same area of land and where there's a significant ecological or economic interaction. And we're always trying to seek the positive interaction, the positive benefits, uh, maximise those and minimise the negative interactions you know, around sort of shade and, and nutrient and water, water use. And typically, agroforestry is either one of two types. It's either silvopastoral, where trees are in combination with grazed areas of pasture with different, different livestock, or, or silver cropping or silver arable, where there are tree and crop combinations. And this isn't a new concept. In fact, the picture on the right of the screen there is, is of Western France in the early 20th century. And you can see a very different landscape there than you might, uh, might see today. And as a result of the sort of post-war common agricultural policy, one of those pol policy um, uh, red lines was that uh, any parcel of land which had more than 50 trees per hectare on it ceased to be agricultural. It became forestry. So unsurprisingly, for many years, people removed trees and hedges to make that land eligible for common agricultural policy support schemes. So, so that removed a lot of the trees out of the landscape and therefore changed the landscape in, in, in a response to the common agricultural policy. But if we take some cues from nature, and think about how we might be able to adapt our farming systems. You know, monocultures we do as farmers because they are easy to manage with inputs and they are easy to manage with mechanisation. But nature doesn't do monoculture at all, ever. And the reason it doesn't do monoculture is it's, it's not as efficient uh, as a mixed system in terms of capturing uh, the resources in terms of sunlight, nutrients and water, and using the available space, both above and below ground. So monocultures have got uh, all the plants in the same place and all the roots in the same place, and, and they're growing at the same period of time, all competing with each other. Nature's worked out a long, long time ago, far smarter than us, that by having different things growing at different times in different spaces, it can utilise those resources in a, in a more efficient way. And this started me thinking about agroforestry in that if we look on the, on the uh, graph at the top of the screen here, you can see that uh, in terms of utilisation of water and light and nutrients, um, the most cereal crops will use those resources early in the season or, or, or late over winter and early in the season. And then by midsummer, those resources are, are are ceasing to be used as those crops mature ready for harvest. Whereas trees start much later in the season. You won't see many trees come into leaf uh, until probably April or even early May. And then they'll carry on right through to the late autumn and leave, lose their leaves and stop photosynthesizing perhaps in, in October or November. So there's a real temporal overlap in that, in that resource utilization. So it's a bit like horticulturalists use a, a, um, a greenhouse to extend the season. Can we use trees to extend the season? And the same thought process is with, in relation to uh, uh, space as well. Uh, as as uh, perhaps cereal farmers, we think uh, perhaps a, a, few, a couple of feet, a metre above ground. And if we're, if we're in, informed, we, we also think below ground. But, but actually, there's a huge amount of space above and below most of the annual crops we grow, which isn't, isn't being used by, by, uh, by our cropping um, programs. Uh, and uh, there's potential to use that, that space above us and below, below us with different uh, crops, which can utilize those areas 
uh, 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 and uh, and help us with productivity. I, I, I laughingly say that, uh, or flippantly say that, uh, perhaps some of us are, are signed up lifelong members of the Flat Earth Society, and we need to think more in, in sort of three dimensions. And where this gets interesting is if if we were to look at something like uh, a forest plantation of trees and an agroforestry plantation. So in this case, on the right hand side, there's a, a forestry plantation of poplars. Um, and you can see the root ball down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, in the forestry situation, all the, all the roots of those trees are very near the surface because that's where the, uh, the nutrients and the water uh, and the nutrition is, is actually located. In an agroforestry context, on the left hand side, you can see a completely different root structure of the tree. Same tree, same variety of poplar planted at the same time, but just managed differently. And because of the, um, uh, the the competition from the arable crop earlier in the season, taking the nutrients and water, um, or the grass crop as it might be, uh, and mix that with some cultivation or some root pruning, and what you end is a completely different root morphology. And that's quite important because actually what you don't want is the trees competing for the nutrients and the water in the same place as the actual arable crop itself. So by manipulation of the agroforestry and management of those root components through pruning or cultivation, you actually segment or partition the tree roots away from the arable crop. And, and therefore you can use deeper in the soil profile as well as the canopy using above ground uh, at different times of the, of the season. This has, this has uh, important implications because actually, you know, one of the one of the things we need to think about in in our current agricultural systems is things like nitrogen use efficiency. And the the UK nitrogen use efficiency is at forty eight percent. Now, if you were to translate that to the bottom line, yeah, over well, over fifty percent of the nitrogen that we purchase into the farm is never taken up by the the intended crop. 48% of that is lost through the farming system uh, into watercourses, into other non-crop crop species. And that's why the, um, the water companies get very exercised about nitrates in drinking water and why there's a European nitrate uh, directive on, on drinking water. So from a res re re resource use efficiency, it's pretty inefficient if we're losing roughly half the nitrogen that we put into our system. Uh, as, as an off-farm uh, pollutant in effect. And some, some work that was done by the French National Research Institute looking at comparing agroforestry, agriculture and forestry uh, uh, shows that unsurprisingly there's, there's very little nitrate leaching out of forestry because there's very little nitrogen used. Uh, in agriculture, um, the, the uh, figure there is sort of 35 kgs per hectare per year. But under agroforestry, you can pretty much halve that loss. So <clears throat> rather than losing it down the drains and into watercourses, you're retaining that nitrogen on farm with those deeper roots and turning it into a carbon form. In this case, it's, it's using perennials, uh, using trees, uh, but that's stopping it leaving the farm. So at least it's stopping the loss of that investment. When we start looking at things like biodiversity, with greater pressure on trying to improve um, or reduce uh, uh, pesticide inputs, insecticides, etc., um, if we can start to think about controlling or managing um, uh, pest populations by having natural refuges across fields uh, that provide overwinter habitats for some of the beneficial insects to reside in, then, then we can actually think about using those uh, natural predators to enhance biodiversity and actually manage crop pest, uh, pest and disease uh, issues. Um, certainly the work that was done at uh, Allerton, the Allerton Research Project, uh, what, 25 years ago, showed that fields greater than 25 acres had, had uh, effectively dead zones in the middle. So agroforestry can help actually provide some of those a bit in the same way as a beetle bank does provide some of those refuges for some of the beneficial insects to help with pest management some of the work that's been done recently looking at uh, biodiversity and agroforestry when we start looking at things like birds 
plants, fungi, and insects in relation to uh, uh, the levels of biodiversity found in, in agroforestry. We see we see better response ratios from agroforestry in relation to birds, um, uh, farmland birds, both uh, fungi and insects. Uh, and, and some of that is by providing that refuge and shelter. Some of it is provided by the provision of, uh, of, of improved food sources for those uh, insects uh, and, and also the, the generation of um, microclimates, so warmer in the winter and perhaps cooler in the summer. Um, if we take that a stage further and, and, and look at some of the research out of Reading University from, from Stanton, who's repeating a PhD project that was done 10 years ago, uh, looking at the individual sort of insect uh, uh, groups, we tend to see in, in agroforestry systems more of the uh, of the beneficial insects. So the spiders, the the, um, the ground beetles, the the pollinators, the parasites, parasitoid wasps, etc., and less of the the damaging insects, uh, the fruit flies, the midges, uh, the root flies, etc. Um, albeit that slugs is of course always a bit of an anathema in the um, perhaps it's in some instances it can has been seen that uh, agroforestry can provide refuges for slugs although you also get some of the the predators as well so um uh, perhaps there's a balance over time but but that, that's pointing in the right direction in terms of having the right the right insects and the right predators there and some other work done by jim mcadam um in northern ireland uh, on the bottom left there shows uh, again comparing ash agroforestry ash woodland and in this case grassland shows very similar trends in terms of improved levels of spiders birds and beetles um the the, the slide on the bottom right here shows six sites looking at an agroforestry system uh, looking at biodiversity overall and pollinators and in most cases the 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 agroforestry is showing more biodiversity and more pollinators uh, uh, compared to a sort of monocultural system. And on our own farm, which was reported in um, a couple of uh, um, agricultural uh, journals uh, last year, uh, we, we've seen sort of two hundred percent more solitary bees and hoverflies, two hundred forty percent more bumblebees, and ten, ten times uh, higher species richness. So it's delivering on that sort of biodiversity goals that, uh, that we're being asked to deliver on but i guess it's not all about it's not about all about ecology and biodiversity what about sort of productivity and the question i'm often asked is how do we compare a monocultural system in, in the background here with a agroforestry system in the foreground how, how do we compare the the outputs the, the productive outputs of those two different systems well the easiest way to do that is is perhaps consider what's called a land equivalent ratio so where you've got two systems pro producing the same you'd have a, a one to one ratio if if one system is producing twice as much it would be a, a two to one ratio so if we look at agri agri a hectare of agroforestry com uh, combining trees and arable crops on the, on the same area and we compare that to where they might be grown separately um, we would need 0.6 hectares of trees and 0.8 hectares of ag agriculture uh, to, to produce the same amount grown separately. That can give us a land equivalent ratio of 1.4. And uh, what that means is uh, you need 100 hectares of agroforestry can produce in total, in terms of the amount of output, as much crop and tree products as 140 hectares of farmland, where those elements are grown separately. <coughs> Now, you look at that and you think, OK, that's 40 percent more productive. That's that's pretty considerable. Um, but that's not me saying it. Uh, the work that's been done from pan-European projects, uh, so a recent project led by Cranfield University, um, com compared 42 tree crop combinations, and it found those land equivalent ratios ranged at worst uh, from one, at best 1.4, but the majority of them being sort of 1.2, 1.3, but that's still 20 or 30% more productive. And it's able to do that principally because the solar panels are turned on for longer. You're utilizing that, that, that solar radiation and those other resources of, of space 
and uh, water and nutrients for longer during the, the season. And you're actually also making the farm bigger by farming in a three-dimensional way by using the more space above ground and also below ground. So more space, bigger farm, and also keeping the, 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 the solar radiation capture turned on for longer allows that productivity to increase. In terms of our sort of climate change obligations or targets, uh, the Committee on Climate Change recommends that government commits to an increase in tree canopy of, of a move from 13 to 17 percent. And we, we've heard literally this week uh, from George Eustis about the, the commitments that the government's seeking in terms of increasing tree planting. <clears throat> um, given that 70 percent of our land area is agricultural, then, then trees have, have to form some part of agriculture. Uh, they can't solely be targeted on non-agricultural areas. And and if we went from 13% to 17%, that would meet our, our net zero emissions by 2050. Um, <clears throat> looking at the most recent data, that would mean that we would need 30,000 hectares of new woodland or 2 billion trees at 2,000 2, stems per hectare, the sort of forestry densities. <clears throat> um, that's a pretty tall ask, and we're a long, long, long way short of that. I think we've only, only achieved about 10 or 12% of that that increase in tree planting. <clears throat> but the, the statistics, if we were looking at agroforestry, if we if we had 5.8% of the land of our agricultural land converted into tree canopy as agroforestry, that would that would meet our our, our zero uh, net emissions target uh, that, that have been set uh, under the Paris Accord. So it, it, it's a reasonably modest area, it's sort of 5.8%. And that, that figure will become apparent when we start looking at what I've done on my own farm later on. So some of the benefits that agroforestry bring that we've already looked at, uh, uh, other than biodiversity, is, is improved soil and water quality protection in terms of actually stopping some uh, new, both nutrients and sediment movement across, across land when street, trees are strategically planted. Importantly, thinking about wind speed reduction, we forget that in the UK we're in a very windy part of the world, and uh, uh, wind is a, is a major vector in terms of evaporation and, and water loss. Uh, so when we see increasingly dry periods during the year, if we can cut down wind speeds, we can cut down evapotranspiration. And there's typically a sort of one to ten ratio. So uh, for every meter height of tree you've got a 10 meter interruption in terms of wind flow uh, and, and it's wind flow or wind speed at ground level, which is the most in, important factor in terms of uh, evapotranspiration. So modifying microclimates in that sense, really important as climate change starts to bite. Um, also thinking at the other end of the scale in terms of drainage, you know, we've seen a very wet winter last a pretty wet autumn, uh, at least in my part of the world, this autumn. And if we can, we can try and use those tree roots to assist with, with deep percolation and drainage, the, they can also assist in terms of draining land and making making our soils more uh, more workable, or, or at least better conditions for planting. So it's all about sort of trying to modify microclimates on, on a local basis. But I guess from a policy perspective, we're we're in an interesting place because agroforestry is very much a hybrid system, uh, and there's a lot of confusion. You know, is it forestry or is it agriculture? And uh, you know, um, foresters and, and farmers have different goals, different objectives. Uh, indeed, different uh, different metrics are used, uh, and different language is used, which we don't really sort of fully understand between the two. In fact, most most farmers have a a pretty or farmers agronomists have a pretty good uh, infection of arborphobia, uh, and equally most foresters have a pretty good uh, infection of agriphobia. And perhaps we need to blend those thinking uh, and those expertise uh, to, to to take take things forward. In terms of policy, uh, interestingly, uh, agroforestry has always been eligible under the Cal Agricultural Policy for about the last ten years. Um, more recently, it was a measure that was uh, available to member states under greening measures and also EFAs, the Ecological Focus Areas. And there was money under Article 23 
uh, to assist or to fund the planting and maintenance over five years of agroforestry. Um, sadly, our England, anyhow, uh, our political leaders uh, and, uh, and DEFRA chose not to make that available to English farmers for various reasons. Um, however, I think things are changing under the new agricultural bill. Agroforestry is mentioned, a commitment to agroforestry. Uh, and uh, literally, as of this week, uh, a new test and trial under the ELMS program has been funded on agroforestry, and that will be looking at the uh, mechanisms uh, for getting agroforestry into ELMS uh, and, and making it workable for, for, for farmers and, and landowners and land managers. But there's no doubt there are some challenges, uh, land tenure being one of them, with 32% um, of the land uh, being tenanted, a long-term program of, of, uh, of a project like planting trees or agroforestry uh, is, is a taller ask than if you own the land. Uh, but perhaps some, some shared new shared ownership models uh, might be needed, whereby the uh, the landlord actually owns the capital asset of the trees, and the tenant gets income for managing or sale of the trees during the, the period of their their tenancy and certainly there there, there have been some uh, some interesting um, uh, and and successful uh, agroforestry systems developed on ten tenanted farms and perhaps we can pick that up on um, pick that up on the uh, question and answer session for those that are interested. But the biggest challenge really has been historically the separate forestry and agricultural policies that have been operated, um, but that that's rapidly changing and. Uh, I think for the probably the first time in 50 years, agriculture and forestry is coming much, much closer together. Uh, and as our domestic agricultural policy and ELM starts to embed itself, we'll see a much, much uh, easier place to operate agroforestry systems. So let's, I'll take you through sort of what, it's, what some of the agroforestry options are uh, and some of the different systems before going on to look at, look at our own system. Uh, typically, it can be it can be any tree or any woody perennial uh, with with any annual annual crop or, or, or pasture based system. So, as the slides here, uh, we've got biomass in the top corner. So that could be could be willow or, or hazel, coppiced, used for wood fuel in the same way as a sort of short rotation coppice. Uh, that's also bringing in the benefits of shelter, uh, wind speed reduction. Uh, uh, more biodiversity and habitat, etc. It could be fruit trees. It could be could be nut trees for for um, uh, nut fruit or nut protein, nut oils. It could be fruit based products. Um, it, it it can be combined with uh, white cereal straw crops, vegetables, uh, pulse crops, etc. So there's a there's a whole range of different things can be done depending on the soil types, the location. Uh, the the need for return on investment etc equally if it was a uh, if a pastoral based system or a livestock based system that could be uh, you know, pigs poultry um, uh, cattle sheep any, any form of, of animal really in fact you know poultry on the bottom left here work really well uh, mobile mobile poultry systems as part of a uh, a silvo pastoral system work, work incredibly well, and it doesn't necessarily even need to be planting of new trees where there's existing woodland on properties. Actually, uh, taking out the the low value wood uh, and um, re uh, reintroduction of livestock into those mature stands, so there's a sort of woodland grazing system can equally be. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, a re really beneficial system. You know, it's it's a natural shelter for those animals, and that can be both in in, in lowland agriculture. Um, it can be in upland agriculture, and increasingly in sort of riparian areas. Thinking about trees, how they fit around watercourses, uh, and protect those uh, riparian areas from from not only nutrients and sediments, but also in terms of in the reverse, uh, helping with with natural flood management. So. When we're thinking about that sort of catchment scale, slowing the, the movement of water from these increasingly intense um, uh, rainfall events and, and slowing that, that, that uh, water movement across land, increasing infiltration, 
uh, creating buffers and allowing that land to drain quicker using the trees as, as sort of pumps to get the water out of the system can be can be very effective. In terms of information, uh, in terms of the economics of agroforestry, I think those of you that, that are interested in any way, there's a new publication uh, which I was involved in helping um, pull together last year. It's a bit like John John Nix's Farm Management Handbook, but for agroforestry, it's the same size as sort of the Nix book. Um, and that, that has a lot of practical uh, management, uh, establishment, and also economic information on, on agroforestry, uh, and that's available if you typed in the agroforestry handbook into Google, that's available as a download, and there's information on, on not only uh, uh, different tree types and different combinations, but also uh, sort of gross margins and net margins and economics and information on sort of carbon sequestration, which, which will become increasingly important uh, in terms of uh, economic um, uh, in, in revenue streams for, for farmers uh, going forward and using using trees uh, to generate some of that that income um, as part of agroforestry is going to be going to be you know r really important so just to uh, just to just run through our, quickly our own um, farming business uh, uh, on a few slides just to take you through uh, I farm in Cambridgeshire uh, on uh, about, about 150 acres. Our drivers really were to to look at um, uh, when we took the farm on as tenants, as first generation farmers, uh, were to look at a sort of more multifunctional land use to spread the sort of cropping and enterprise diversity, uh, to build up biodiversity and habitat creation and open up new markets. And, and in the first few years, as the slide shows, when we moved onto the farm, we recognised that soil erosion was a um, uh, 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 was a real issue on our farm, and um, we needed to do something about that. So, in two thousand nine, we planted uh, an agroforestry system based on 80, 85 trees per hectare. Uh, that was really challenged by having a farm fifteen year farm business tenancy. Uh, we needed to retain cap eligibility. We had limited capital, and uh, we we needed a profitable system. And we had no livestock facilities on the farm, so we chose to plant fruit. Uh, and uh, as as you can see from the slide, um, that was based on sort of eighty five trees per hectare um, in twenty four meter alleys uh, with three meter sort of strips under each tree. Um, that gave us. Um, um, a three meter pollen nectar strip under each, each tree strip uh, with with 24 meter working alleys facing north south to minimize the sort of shade influence especially at this time of year um, o over the uh, last decade the trees have grown uh, the pollen nectar strips have provided that sort of beneficial environment as well as being funded as pollen nectar under our hls agreement um, so we developed a, a 52 hectare, 125 acre system with uh, um, 24 meter alleys, and the trees account for 8 percent of the land area. So 92 percent of the land area is doing exactly what it was doing before. Um, uh, alongside that, uh, so the farm has been organic for, for 13 years. Um, we've had we've, so no insecticides, pet, uh, fungicides, no artificial fertilizers. We're, we've uh, developed a, a robo crop uh, into a hoe system for all our cereals, uh, and that's that's also led with the agroforestry to a sort of six meter controlled traffic farming system where everything we've got is either six, twelve, twenty four me meters. Um, Stephen, can I, Stephen, can I just butt in? Sorry, I'm yeah. just conscious of time, and yeah. I've got questions come in for you. Um, so I'm just wondering whether or not uh, there's a chance that you could just whiz through, maybe. Yeah, what exactly through. What I'll be pretty Hello. quick. Okay, uh, thanks. That, that's allowed us to sort of develop a sort of companion planting system as well. So not only have we got the trees and the perennials, but the annual crops, but they've always got an undersow of of, uh, of a companion plant, so that the solar panels are. And back to that original thing, the solar panels are all, all, always turned on. So just a few pictures of what the farm looks like now. Um, uh, Ten years on, uh, having established the agroforestry system, um, you can see the sort of uh, the crops that were growing. Um, there's a, the picture from the air. 
Um, it's me that does the combine driving, so uh, we, I'll have to make sure that I drive straight. And we'll finish a cereal harvest, and then we'll go back in and, and harvest the fruit uh, late, later in the season. 13 varieties of fruit, which we then turn into, into juice or sell, uh, sell fresh. Um, just a couple of points to pick up on. Last year, we had some major storms in the middle of summer. Uh, the oats that we were growing at the time probably lost 20% of the grain onto the floor from, from the grain being threshed with the sort of 60 mile hour winds for three days. In the agroforestry, actually that halved the loss uh, because the wind speeds were reduced. So that was that was pretty significant for us. And then this year, 2020, uh, hellish wet winter, very dry spring. You can see here from the picture, actually the crops immediately adjacent to the trees was pretty much twice the crop uh, that it was just out a bit further in the field, better drainage in the winter, um, better, better moisture retention in the spring uh, as an impact from the tree. So it's giving us some resilience. So just last four slides, um, as Paul mentioned, you know, one of the things we did was to turn one of the farm buildings into a farm shop. So we retail everything through that now in terms of uh, the apple produce. Uh, and what agroforestry is giving us, it really is, it's not, um, you know, there's the word sustainable intensification, but it's giving us ecological intensification. It's using what we have better. It's improving that resource capture and use. We're getting equal to or greater productivity than we had before um, and um, enhanced biodiversity and soil protection. Uh, perhaps we're slightly ahead of the sort of policy developments. Um, so just to finish, I think that, you know, agroforestry can be a sort of climate smart breakthrough. Uh, farms could, don't need to do the whole farm, but, you know, even if farms did 20% of their land, that would be well above the 5.8% we'd need to meet our, our, our zero net climate emissions. Our own farm, we're at 8%, so we're still well above that 5.8%. Um, it's one of the few options with the potential to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, help protect natural resources whilst producing more food and biomass. It's more output and no more input. It's three-dimensional farming. It's a bigger farm. Uh, and, and bear in mind that sometimes, as Paul started the conversation, all that's holding you back is all that's holding you back really is the way you think about things, and it's all in our head. And perhaps we just need to think about things differently. Okay, thanks very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. I think there's a hell of a lot there to uh, within a short time to digest and take in. Um, I do have a few questions for you, but what I want to do is just quickly move on now to uh, to uh, get Jake on, um, if that's okay, and then come back to you. Um, hopefully at the end. Yeah. Um, but just before uh, we go to Jake, I would just like your interaction again, really to feed in to what Jake's going to be talking about with a poll question. Um, so uh, is there, there's a poll question coming up, um, which is very relatable to uh, our next speaker with Jake. Uh, do you think that keeping soils covered in between cash crops is an important element in developing a robust and viable arable operation? Again, four answers, same way to poll. Um, while you're doing that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker with Jake. Um, Jake Freestone um, manages 1,590 hectares in hand farming operation, which is part of the Overbury Enterprises which is found on the Gloucestershire Worcestershire border. The farm has been in, on the no-till journey since 2013. Integrated farming husbandry is a key aspect of Jake's farming ethos, which nicely links into the farm's leaf demonstration farm status. Also, as part of his, this strategy, he has introduced breed and ewe, a breeding ewe flock, as well as being part of an ongoing of ongoing um, environmental schemes. Jake has undertaken enough uh, has also um, undertaken enough field farming scholarship which concentrated on breaking the wheat yield plateau in the UK. He was awarded the Farm Business Food and Farming Progressive Farmer of the Year in 2014. In 2015 Jake was runner up in the Farmers Guardian Arable Innovator of the Year competition. And this year uh, we compact Jake on the back again. Uh, Jake has added Soil Farmer of the Year to his cabinet. So, Jake, before you get started, I just want to go back to see the results of that poll, which will link in nicely to your presentation. There we are, Jake. You've got a converted audience, maybe. 
um, but we just need to convert the others that aren't believing. So with that, Jake, I mean, um, I presume your answer, your, you will answer how you feel about it and you will show that in your presentation. So over to you. Uh, Paul, thank you very, very much indeed um, for that welcome. And uh, it's great to be here to be able to present to you uh, today on a, on a topic uh, that's pretty far reaching, actually, in terms of the challenges that we face in front of us. Um, as uh, what was outlined in yesterday's uh, announcement from the Secretary of State, or what wasn't. Um, it seems that my slides are like Stephen's, somewhere in the ether. Um, and uh, Emily, I think, is going to bring them up for you. But uh, just to get let you uh, let you get going as to um, as to here we are. So we're going to talk um, a lot about um, the farm here at Overbury. We're going to talk rotations, cover crops, a bit of niche cropping. But all that is uh, integrated into integrated pest management and um, how we can. Uh, use our farming system to improve productivity, to reduce costs, but also have better environmental gains as well. Um, now, um, I cannot flip my size flies, my flies, my size slides forward. So we're going into, uh, we're going to talk about rotations. Then we're going to talk about cover crops. We're also then going to talk a little bit about IPM strategies. So integrated pest management. What's that? Where does it sit within the whole farming system? Uh, then I want to talk about biocontrol. So um, how can we look at using other products, other non-chemical solutions to uh, improve our farm output and reduce the impact on the environment, which is what we're all being um, asked to do. And it's something that we should really be doing for our own benefit uh, at the same time. And then I just want to wrap up with a couple of slides in conclusion. So really just to kick off a little bit of introduction about myself, uh, Paul's already given quite a, a good introduction into, into me. I started here at Overbury as the farm manager in 2003, and we've seen some huge changes um, in the farming system since that point, moving from a plow-based system through to minimal cultivations, um, top-down carriers, horse drill, rolling, um, and now we're actually moving on to um, our no-till system, which we've sort of been developing over the last few years. And one of the uh, sayings that uh, I kind of go with a lot and it means something to me was Nelson Mandela um, once saying that it always seems impossible until it is done and I think Steve would probably agree that actually uh, a lot of the issues that we have in taking up these new farming systems um, is all in our heads. Um, so we move on to the next slide this is a little bit about that about the farm as well so um, not only farming in hand here um, at Overbury, we're also on a contract farming agreement next door. We have a whole range of different soil types, and that makes this job really interesting. It makes it challenging as well at some times. Um, but we're on a thousand foot above sea level, Cotswold brash, um, pH is over eight. Uh, they tend to lock up a lot of nutrients very, very quickly. Then we come down over sand and gravel land uh, with irrigation where we have some land let for vegetables. And then we go on to Evesham series clay, um, good strong black grass sort of territory, um, under drained, um, and that, uh, that has its own challenges as well. We've been involved in leaf linking environment and farming uh, since 2004, having done the leaf mark since 2007. And in 2012, we became a leaf demonstration farm. And the, the thing that is important to me is to be able to demonstrate to other farmers, the general public, um, and basically anybody that's interested, um, how we can farm in a more sustainable uh, system going forward. Because um, next slide, we don't want to end up uh, with our farmland looking like this. Um, this was from the 1930s. Um, I don't have much hair, but I wasn't around at that point. Um, but this was in the Great Plains um, of Oklahoma, where about 10 years of drought and cultivation um, basically ruined uh, great areas of, of that country, um, reduced an awful lot of organic matter up into the, the atmosphere and took it away from uh, being able to uh, utilize by the farmers and actually grow, uh, grow food. And this was, um, this was all part of my Nuffield study, which was breaking the wheat yield plateau in the UK. And I went away thinking I'm going to find um, a silver bullet, a, a magic bullet, um, new disease resistance, uh, genetic solution. 
Um, but actually what it came down to is that how we've been managing or mismanaging our soils for a generation or two um, has had a huge impact on our yields plateauing, our cost of production increasing, um, and also the amount of artificial inputs we are needing to put onto our fields to try and maintain that productivity. Um, and if we just move to the next slide, this was that light bulb moment. This was uh, two different farming systems, um, either side of a road. Uh, on the left-hand side, 20 years of zero tillage. Um, that soil, uh, we just had a couple of inches of rain. That water had penetrated into that soil. Um, with the, uh, the residue on the surface, it was sheltered. Uh, it was cooler, evaporation was less. Uh, and then on the right hand side was a very traditional uh, cultivation system. So as soon as the headers had gone through, um, big rippers came out and you could see these plumes of dust uh, across the countryside uh, where they were stirring up all this soil. Um, and it was structureless. When it rained, it capped on the surface, micro compaction, um, 120 Fahrenheit um, temperatures and windy conditions and that water disappeared. And um, you think, well, you know, what's, what's Oklahoma got to do with uh, farming at Overbury? Um, but actually, the challenges are still the same. It's moisture. Uh, we have too much moisture or we have too little moisture. Um, and, and too little moisture is still, still the limiting effect um, on UK arable production. You might not believe it after the last two winters that we've had, but it is. Next slide, please. So we moved on to our system of regenerative agriculture in farming, and that pivots around three key elements, which is uh, minimising soil disturbance. So we don't want to do much to the soil if we can possibly help it. We want that structure to remain in place. We want the plants and the plant roots and the worms to do that structure building for us. That helps carry farm machinery. It reduces soil erosion and helps in infiltrate water much more than soil that has been uh, cultivated and has lost that structure. Uh, we want to keep that soil covered at all times. Stephen mentioned some excellent points about um, using windbreaks to try and reduce the evapotranspiration from our soils. Well, if those soils are covered, they're cooler and they're damper. So that evapotration, evapotranspiration is less. But also by covering them, we're actually shielding them. And some, I met some farmers in America in my studies and they had a fantastic terminology, which is called soil armor. And that's effectively what it is. You can imagine a little shield going up above the soil to protect it from, uh, from raindrops. And you know, we know we're having periods of heavier rainfall for more intense periods of time. It's nothing to get an inch or inch and a half or two inches of rain in a 24 hour period these days. If you look back through the records uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, those events were relatively few and far between and and now you know almost on a monthly basis we're having those sorts of um, heavy periods of rainfall and then finally the last bit is a long and diverse crop rotation and this keys into integrated pest management and how we can um, reduce our reliance on specific crops by uh, having a wider basket for for marketing and uh, and, and crop sales uh, there's obviously a lot of logistics to look at um, but that wider rotation is absolutely crucial. And we'll kick off with some of that in terms of rotations. Next slide. So in uh, Overbury here, we've got, um, and again, Emily, we have got um, quite a difference in rotation. But what I, I'm trying to get to a point is, is where we can have grass crops. So your cereals, your barleys, your wheats, um, mixed in with legumes, peas and beans. Uh, and then also some brassica crops in there as well, oilseed rape. I'm going to come on to oilseed rape in a second because that is a challenge trying to grow that in the current scenario. Um, but all of these crops have different elements that they can bring to that rotation from uh, agronomic benefits in terms of weed and disease resistance, pesticide uh, resistance um, and genetic variability. We're having spring crops, we're having winter crops to try and break up um, the cycle of different weeds uh, which can create headaches, uh, can produce extra costs and also reduce our returns. But also by having a rotation that is wide and diverse, we can actually have um, elements of cover crops in there. So this soil armour um, and, uh, and again, keeping a maximum solar, um, solar interception is absolutely crucial. But the main crops are, are the main crops, they're commodities. Um, you look at oilseed rape now, you could almost argue that's becoming into a niche crop. Next slide. 
Um, but niche crops are also important as to how we can try and spread the risk um, to our businesses uh, in terms of different planting dates, different harvesting dates, uh, different markets that are affected by different issues from around the world. So we've been playing around with a few other crops uh, this year. We've got some winter linseed in the ground as a potential oilseed rape uh, alternative. We have some British quinoa in the ground. Well, not, not at the moment, but we will have. Um, as um, as an alternative in a small area. And then also historically, we've looked at soya beans. So I'm thinking of, of sunflowers in the future, maize to harvest. Um, geographically, we might not be in the best place for those, certainly not at altitude on the top of the hill, um, but some of, on, some of the lighter land in the Vale where we have irrigation, that's something that we might be able to have a look at. Um, but it's keeping an open mind, isn't it? It's about what's out there. Can there be a niche market, if ideally a local market, um, so that we can reduce our food miles and also have a better understanding of the marketing to try and capture some of that value added um, side of, of, the, uh, of the operation. We also need to manage that with our existing farm labor and farm machinery. So it's all very well picking a niche crop, but then if you've got nothing to harvest it or nothing to dry it with, then obviously you are into a lot of different, uh, different issues there that you'll need to try and sort out. Um, and then click on to the next slide, we go into rotation where um, we have got the opportunity to grow cover crops that can help other enterprises. So enterprise stacking is really crucial to us here. Um, since moving into this no-till system, our livestock enterprises moved outdoors for lambing and winter housing. That saved us about 12,000 pounds worth of annual feed and forage costs. The user healthier, they're happier, um, they're manuring and turning that organic matter that's being grown in front of them into a more nutrient available um, complex that our, uh, our plants are able to uptake. So there's some huge benefits across um, the, whole, the whole farm, not just looking at that, en that enterprise in its, in its uh, individualness. And I think this diversity is absolutely crucial to maintaining a, a, a more uh, diverse um, farming system and also a biological system that uh, that we're interacting is. Next slide. And on that point, we have been playing around with companion cropping and oilseed rape for about the last five years. Um, and Andy Howard, who's a Nuffield scholar from 2014, got, got us onto this. Growing uh, companions, uh, we've now boiled it down to vetches, uh, bursine clover, buckwheat and phacelia in with the oilseed rape. And um, this is having some huge advantages agronomically in terms of how our crops are growing. Um, so in terms of reduced uh, spend in, in fungicides, in fertilizers, and more importantly, insecticides. So across the board on the farm now, we're not using any insecticides. We haven't done for the last four years. Um, and that's really helping with our IPM, our field boundaries, our beetle banks in the middle of fields. Um, and that's also helping with our uh, wider top end predators as well. So our, our mammals and our farmland bird species. Um, and in terms of monitoring and keeping a track of those, we'll, we'll come on to that a bit later on. So the companion cropping costing us about 30 pounds a hectare, which is the same as the pre-emergence herbicide, which we're not putting on anymore. Um, and then we're taking it out about this time of year with, um, with an Astro Curb product. Um, to uh, to remove that uh, that companion crop because our, our climate will take care of the buckwheat, but it won't really do anything else. Um, and in terms of next slide, please, um, what's it actually bringing to the party? Well, this year in that field that was on the previous slide, um, we had a bit of a um, bit of a trial going on as to uh, what was the companion actually bringing to the crop. Um, so we switched it off for half of it, and we were actually walking the crop, thinking. Um, exactly uh, what uh, what the differences were. The, the, the oilseed rape in the companion looked greener, it looked healthier, um, it looked more vibrant and there was less disease. So we took some samples across the field um, and we added this up in terms of, right, let's get it analyzed. So, so what have we got? So where we have companion on the left hand, sorry, where we have no companion on the left hand side, we had a fresh weight of 8.9 tons per hectare a dry weight of 1.79. You compare that with the companion of 8.6 tons and 1.73. So effectively, we've grown the same amount of oilseed rate biomass. We had 11 plants um, down a meter drill row. Um, so they were all thereabouts, same size plants, same, um, 
same germination, same establishment. But then what was really fascinating to, to us was the analysis of the nutrients. Uh, so if you look at the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, the calcium, the magnesium, and the sulfur, um, all of those um, had higher levels in the oilseed rape where the companion was being grown uh, as opposed to without it. And to me, that um, is telling me that one plus one is definitely equaling three. Um, so in, there is there is a synergy that is going on between these plants and the and the cash crop that we're trying to get. So if we take nitrogen, for instance, where we don't have the companion, we have a shortfall of 17 kilos per hectare. Um, actually, where we have got a companion crop, that shortfall is only 1.9. So actually, which is almost insignificant. Um, so that's having a huge impact. This crop has only had 17 kilos of nitrogen, no fungicide. Um, and it seems to be in a much more balanced situation. So if we move on to cover cropping, uh, which is the next part of the slide, and we'll jump on two slides, please, Emily. Let's go to that one, oh, back one. Um, so this is uh, the Swiss Army knife it, that, that I have in my pocket. It kind of does an awful lot of good things around the farm. Uh, from from uh, reducing soil erosion, crucial for us, we're on thin soil, we're on a slope, and we're on sand reducing soil compaction. We know that when we've had heavy rainfall, we're drilling wheat after oilseed rape with a companion crop, um, with sorry, with a cover crop, then our, our drill tractor is actually staying uh, out of the soil and it's traveling better. We know it's building soil organic matter, it's capturing carbon and putting it into the soil. It's feeding the bugs under the soil. And actually another great thing is it's actually encouraging a lot of pollinators um, to, uh, to get onto those crops um, back in late October into November, where we've got radishes and mustards flowering. Um, it's a great food source for those extra um, butterflies and, and bees that we see sitting around and, and moths sitting around the farm. Lots of nutrient capture going on. Again, it, you know, some of these cover crops can have um, 70 to 100 kilograms of nitrogen locked up into them. And in terms of nitrogen use efficiency, uh, that's being captured within our crop. Um, it's not going down the water course, which is absolutely hugely important. Um, fertility building, infiltration, and I'm not so sure about weed suppression yet. There's still work to be done on that. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, um, this is, again, a, a classic example of, of what it's actually enabling us to do is capturing carbon. It's infiltrating water, uh, whereas bare soil is doing the reverse of those. So quickly onto the next slide. So we were into cover crops and it's not something that you want to just dive straight into in terms of integrated farm management um, and, and the wheel that the leaf integrated farm management wheel is. Uh, there's a lot of preparation going on. Uh, quick click of the button. Um, the five minute fallow, this is crucial. As Stephen was saying, the sun is at its brightest in August when all of our other solar panels are being switched off. So timeliness is key. We've got good day length. We've got soil temperatures which are warm, we've got moisture in the ground, and you can always get a cover crop seed to grow. The spend reflects the time. So if it's in for a short period of time, so after peas and before wheat, maybe a five or a six week window, the spend might be 10, 12 pounds a hectare just on some mustard or something really cheap that you can get to grow. Um, and diversity is key. Um, so again, going on to cover crops, we'll see one in a second, um, that uh, is going to be in there for a long period of time, then I'm quite happy to invest um, 30 to 40 pounds a hectare based on having some grasses, having some legumes, um, having some brassicas in there to try and have the benefit of all of those different rooting systems and what they can actually feed the soil biology with, which is absolutely crucial to maintaining healthy soil and then help having a healthy crop. Um, one more click of the button and timing again is everything. Um, our best cover crops come from planting in the first week of August um, and you can have probably five to seven tons of dry matter grown at that time whereas the first week of September you might have one one and a half tons of dry matter that you can grow at that point so uh, it's really really important to really press on and, and get that done next slide please uh, and this is what diversity is all about two different species uh, admittedly in two different mixes um, but you've got a fodder radish there as an example. That's a taproot going down. We pulled them down 80 centimetres deep um, and they pulled out of the ground like a big string of spaghetti. And you've got the flip side of that, which is a sunflower ball of root. And all of that, uh, those fibrous roots there, they're holding that soil in place. So when we go through with the drill, 
um, we will actually be able to uh, to be able to not move the soil around, not germinate so many weeds. But in terms of soil structure, that is doing an amazing job. Quick click of the button, and we will see that cover oh, cover crops are better than tillage. I'll just leave that there for a second. Next slide. But we can't go into it sort of just willy nilly, right? We're going to plant some cover crops. We need to have a bit of a thought about what we're going to do. So again, quick click of the button uh, is destruction. What are we going to do with them? Um, are we going to spray off with glyphosate? Are we going to graze them? Or are we going to use a crimper roller to try and get rid of them? And then uh, how, how and when are we going to do that? Um, and what sort of uh, options are we going to do? Nutrient supply, you have ca captured an awful lot of nitrogen, phosphate, um, magnesium, manganese, sulfur, uh, all in that cover crop. And um, we need to make sure that when we plant our cash crop into that, that we're not planting that into a nutrient um, poor status that's going to affect germination and then the, uh, the, the subsequent um, profitability of that crop. Um, and then also quick click, we get to pests. So, um, you know, in terms of diversity, I don't tend to worry too much about aphids because, um, you know, within that whole ecosystem of a cover crop, there will be predators. Um, we're finding rove beetles on the farm now that we never used to see before. They, they eat slugs, uh, we, we're full of spiders. Um, and then quickly on the next slide, again, with disease. So again, if you have a monoculture, of a brassica cover crop or monoculture of, of oats, uh, then you may well get carryover of disease going into the next crop. But by keeping it diverse, the population of, uh, of everything is being diluted, so the impact is less. But effectively, you've planned your cover crop, you've you want to then come in and plant your cash crop into that mixture, this is how you need to do it. Next slide. Insert video here. Oh, are we not having a video? So if you can't grow your own cover crops, then there are alternatives that you can do um, in terms of uh, making compost, uh, using organic manures. Um, all of these still have the same uh, benefits. They have some disadvantages in terms of logistics and storing and application, um, but effectively they're acting as soil armor, they're providing nutrients and they're feeding the soil biology that's in the ground. And then quickly we'll just pop on to IPM strategies and then the next slide as well. Uh, which is uh, integrated pest management. So this fits in within uh, integrated crop management and then integrated farm management. So uh, the next slide will show you the, the leaf IFM wheel. Um, and this is how we uh, manage our business um, based on these nine principles. And if you take a cover crop, uh, virtually everything that you can see on that wheel uh, has an impact on the cover crop and the cover crop does on the whole farming system. So it's helping with soil management, it's helping with, cross, with, with, with crop health and protection, it's reducing pollution, uh, animal husbandry if you're grazing it, uh, it provides a more energy efficient farming system, it's better water management if it flowers, um, you've got much more pollen and nectar available. And actually this year we've had some fantastic com community engagement and feedback from having fields of sunflowers where we've had to fallow crops this year. So it has some really, really huge benefits. Um, and then we'll just move on to the next, next slide quickly. So we'll, we've talked about rotation, we've talked about cover crops, uh, we'll talk briefly about cultivation, but effectively we, we need to do some cultivation to potentially break up resistance strategies. So it's not something we're totally against, but I think we need to do as little as that that we possibly can to stop reducing, uh, producing and releasing greenhouse gases. That's really, really important. And if we move on to variety and choice and genetic ability to use varieties that have that genetic resistance, that means we then don't need to apply quite so much chemistry to try and do that uh, controlling job or even miss out something completely. And, and in terms of varieties this year, we've got blends in the ground, milling wheat blends to have a look at that genetic makeup within the field as to how we can use overall um, uh, mixed species to try and reduce um, fungicide requirements and fungal pressures. 
Uh, monitoring is really, really crucial in terms of, you know, you need to measure your changes. Um, and then pesticide, which is the very last point of, uh, of what we need to get to, which is using the right product at the right time with the right dose uh, and the right application technology. So those are really all very, very important. And some IPM in action. Uh, this was a shot I took, um, which I actually found fascinating in a cover crop of with some beans and oats, uh, a ladybird munching on an aphid. Uh, and, you know, to me, that sums up what we're trying to do. Um, and then quickly, if we're just going to wrap up uh, onto uh, biocontrol. Now, this is something that's quite new. It's quite interesting. We, we live in a biological world, but we've sort of forgotten about biology because we've uh, we, we've been taken over by a chemical world and a chemical solution. So we need to have a look at some biological um, uh, biological um, solutions to try and get over some of the problems that we've connected, collected. So if we just quickly slide on to the next one, this is a field that we trialled last year. Um, if you can imagine a line going sort of uh, north-south or sort of from 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock on that, the left-hand side was the farm standard, uh, which is a four-spray fungicide approach last year. Um, and there are the costings on there. The right-hand side was a biological control. Um, with a slightly less yield, but we didn't spend so much money on it. Um, and the farm standard yielded 160 kilos a hectare more and 170 pounds a tonne was uh, an improved output of 27 pounds 20. But the biological control gave an increased margin of just over 10 pounds. Um, so although it's not just about the yield at the end of the day, it's about profitability and it's about the margin that we need to have a look at. Uh, and then we'll just move on to the next one very, very quickly just to wrap up. So where does the biological story start for us? Well, that starts with the seed. Um, so we're not using seed dressings other than manganese and zinc, um, but we're actually applying phosphate and silicon and then nitrogen fixing bugs and phosphate releasing bacteria into the seed, um, seed drench that we're applying onto these fields. And then if we move quickly on, this is helping us with uh, improving our rhizosphere one click. Um, and what, you know, why do we want to do that? Well, that's the interface between the plant and the soil and the healthier and the more active we can get that, uh, the more we'll get for free. Uh, we've got nine, no, we haven't. We've got six tons of phosphate locked up in our soils. We just can't access it because the biology isn't there to be able to do it. If we can unlock that key, then that fertilizer is there for free and it's hundreds of years worth of, worth of produce that we can, uh, we can tap into. Um, it's also, if we just click, it's also reducing our costs. So historically, we would have been a DAP at the time of drilling to give phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, that was £40 a hectare. We're now about £15 a hectare with our seed drench, not, it, not uh, taking into account the reduction in fungicide seed dressing costs. And then next click. So that's also helping to improve our soil health. Why do we want to have healthier soil and then put a fungicide coated seed into our soil? Uh, which is helping us to reduce our synthetics and effectively increase our profit. And it really is child's play next. Um, how do we then assess what we're doing? So going back to our IPM in terms of our monitoring, um, this is a, uh, something we've just started to look at. It's a microbiometer, and this is looking at bacteria and fungal populations within our soil. And I've just got three fields here, and literally this was me and, and JJ doing it. It took 20 minutes to do a sample on the kitchen table. It's not expensive. Um, and it gives you an idea of where your soil sits. So the top field, Sheldon's, is uh, up on the hill, Cotswold Brash, um, and it's looking at um, soil microbe level of 551 uh, micro, um, oh, hang on a minute, micrograms of carbon, that's it, per gram of soil. And we're looking for a fungal to bacteria ratio of one to one. Our soils predominantly have been bacterially dominated, we need to get them more fungally dominated. Um, so that's actually a pretty good healthy soil. Anything over 600 is excellent, anything under 200 is really poor. The next field down, those of you that watch Country File, oh sorry, next next slide down, those of you that saw Country Files yesterday saw um, a field of X sugar uh, uh, beetroot, um, this was that foil, this was that soil with a really low um, micrograms of carbon in that soil and very low fungal population and that's because it's been cultivated it's been stirred up those fungal populations have been displaced and smashed up that's what we do when we cultivate soils and the field next to it again from country field yesterday is the same soil type as the aerodrome field the one above it sand over gravel in a no-till situation and the fungal levels there uh, we got fungus is kind of growing out of the ground 
um, is uh, is just about right on the money is where we want it to be one to one. So then we're taking this next step further, which is to brew our own compost. Uh, this is the Johnson Sioux um, bioreactor, um, and it's a mixture of wood chip, grass, hay and straw, horse manure, poultry litter, soil inoculum from the different fields. Um, around the soil types that we've got and from woodland parcels within those fields that haven't been disturbed for, for years and years, um, and also worms. So this will be uh, composted down for 12 months. It's in an IBC. Um, in 12 months' time, we'll be able to get some extract out of that, and that will form the basis of our seed dressing for next year. So in conclusion, what we really need to have a look at um, is, next slide, um, it's a, it's a systems approach. We're looking at rotation. Uh, that gives us the the, uh, the opening for cover cropping and also for livestock integration as well. Um, we're looking at the machinery choice and we're learning a lot. Every day and every year, we're learning new things and new techniques to improve the system that we're looking at. But that's fun. That's what farming is all about. Um, we need to look after our asset, which is what we're standing on or sitting on, and actually seeing it wash down the field or off the farm track. track is pretty disheartening. And I think it will give us opportunities in the future as uh, part of a sustainable farming initiative. We're looking at net zero, we're looking at carbon payments and um, reduced reliance on other inputs, uh, all of which will help improve the bottom line and our farm profitability. And if we just go on to the final slide, um, we must never be afraid to try something new. Remember, amateurs built the ark, professionals built the Titanic. And one more click. And this Saturday is World Soil Day, uh, which again is in really important. And it's also the opening launch for the um, Soil Farm of the Year competition by the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit. Uh, applications are open from Saturday, so get involved. It's a fun competition and great, uh, great to get involved. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Jake. Fantastic. Um, I've got lots of questions, um, but because I'm going to try and get through a fair few between for you and Stephen, I just really want to uh, say to people, I think we're going to be about 10 minutes over our, not our time for half past because I just want to try and get through some of these questions. Um, Stephen, if you're there, I'll probably just give you a bit of a break, Jake, just to get your breath back before I ask you the first question. Stephen, um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, they're, they're quite related, really. Um, I mean, uh, have you found that tree root system has um, any effect on um, common sort of problems such as wireworm and pests? And we've got another question about weeds, about roots and suppression of weeds. Have you found this at all? Um, so what we have, we've done some research work with uh, universities and what we have seen is a greater abundance of uh, predators. So in the same way Jake talked about having more predators, natural predators above ground, we're seeing having those perennial roots in the ground, we're seeing more natural predators below ground, which is is helping balance that, that things like, so we don't see bronze with wild worms um, and, and other things like nematodes as an example, because we've got more, more natural predators there to help balance those out. So um, what we have seen from research work is, is much, much higher levels of things like mycorrhizae beneficial uh, soil fungi, which, which is help, again, acting, providing that sheath around plant, plant roots and helping protect them from, uh, from pathogenic attack or, or pest attack. Brilliant. And another question here, which is quite apt, really, for going on for trees. Um, does tree shelter affect grain moisture at harvest? Uh, well, that, that really, that's all about tree size. So it's really important to get the right tree in the right place. Uh, and you know, we're, we're, we chose to grow fruit trees, so nothing's about sort of above four metres. So we, we don't see any impact of higher moisture contents in the grain at harvest than we do with the fields that, you know, don't don't have trees in. But, but um, what we do see is when we get those adverse weather conditions of either really hot or really dry, we've got to a level of protection that those trees trees provide uh, to the adjacent crops. Um, and one last question before I move uh, over to Jake. Um, just uh, an interesting one. Um, length of time scale to reach full return of investment <laughs> for what you've done, or have you reached it yet? Yeah, well, I mean, for, for, for our situation, I'm a tenant. So, you know, I, I put my own sort of money into the pot. Um, 
and we needed cost recovery and a profitable you know, is a commercial profitable activity so uh we got we got we start getting fruit yield after year four and we got full cost recovery on on our establishment after year seven and a half um but that's with that's with uh, a top fruit tree you know if you were if you were planting oak trees and then your your return is probably going to be greater but your your return time is going to be much much longer so really you know you might have to match the the tree type and the, the system type to your desire for a return on investment brilliant thanks Stephen. jake i'm going to come over to you um uh, if you're ready for the first one which i think is uh, again very apt on lots of people's minds um do you think that your approach to farming would be possible without livestock or glyphosate uh, yeah, a really great question. Very topical. Um, we're looking at alternatives to glyphosate. And to be honest, we haven't found anything that's reliable enough yet. So looking at crimper rollers um, work well in certain circumstances, certain crops at certain times of the year. Um, but it is very hit and miss. Livestock are really helpful in reducing the overall volume of, of cover crop. Um, but actually, you still have weeds in the bottom that you need to uh, you need to control before you you uh, plant your cash crop. Um, so without the two of those, it would become very very tricky. I think you'd probably end up sort of mulching and then having to do a, a really light shallow cultivation just to try and pull those weeds out onto the surface to let them dry um, and, and kill them off that way. But it, it is a real challenge. Mm. I think uh, that's on a lot of people's mind, what happens if glyphosate goes um, and what systems they use. I suppose you'll just choose your species a bit more effectively, will you, and hope for um, frost kill, but we don't often get that now. I, I, I think that's the real challenge. I mean, where it works great in the, you know, North America, Canada, minus 30 kills everything, not a problem. Um, the thought of trying to go out, A, and, and hoping and praying for a frost, and then B, it being frosty and hard enough to carry a, a tractor and, a, and a, a Cambridge roller in the middle of winter, I just think is a real is a real challenge and a real risk um, if that was your only opportunity. I think the other thing that it does enable us to do as an industry is to, is to get new young entrants into farming uh, with arable farmers that have fields of cover crops that they want a sheep enterprise to come and uh, parachute sheep in, keep them there for a couple of three months, um, you know, recover the cost of the seed potentially, uh, but actually for a new entrance with a couple of hundred ewes uh, and several of these farms dotted around, I, I think that's a really great story that we can tell in an industry. Mm, I think. Um, another one though, Jay, just going on, it's on, uh, you talked about all seed rape, obviously you're not going to get away without an all seed rape uh, question. <laughs> um, uh, for capistem flea beetle control, could you graze the intercropped all seed rape with sheep rather than removing with astrocurb? Um, I think you could. Um, the, the worry for me would be that the vetch would survive. Uh, we did leave a bit last year to try and take it to harvest as a companion right the way through. Um, and actually, we probably made more money out of the vetch than we did out of the oilseed rape. So whether we should do a bit more of that, but I don't fancy, you know, the whole crop being like that. Um, because it did just pull all the oil seed rake down. It was right down on the floor. Um, and, you know, we've, we've got a good header for picking low crops up, which was fortunate. Um, you probably could graze it out, but my worry would be that it would come back. Uh, unless we can look at varieties uh, that are less frost hardy. Um, so we'll kill off like buckwheat earlier in the season. Uh, but then we will still have black grass and brome around that germinate later in the season through the spring. So there's, you know, there's a need for at the moment for that herbicide element. Um, one other question, Jake, before I just quickly go back to Stephen. Um, how long did it take to start seeing a real difference in the soil quality and the arrival of beneficial predators? Um, it depends on your soil type. The Cotswold brash um, has responded incredibly fast. Um, two to three years, you'll start to see a lot more earthworm casts on the surface you'll start to find rove beetles running around up there. And it's really uh, heartening to be able to see that actually how quickly um, money, uh, Mother Nature can repair the damage that we've done. And I think that works really well because it's a very aerated type of soil. We've got a lot of stone. There's a lot of porous holes in there to let oxygen in, which, which really does make the system work. 
Um, obviously, if you've got oxygen going in, you've got carbon dioxide coming out. So you've got, um, you know, some benefit and also some disadvantage um, in terms of trying to build up organic matter. But the aerating effect of that soil type makes it happen remarkably quickly. The Evesham series clay, we're six years into it now, um, and it is uh, happening. Uh, we've, we've got a lot more soil life down there. We've got a lot more earthworms. Um, but it is a slower process. And I think that's because the, um, the magnesium, it's magnesium soil, which is holding all those particles together, making it more anaerobic, uh, not helped by two very, very wet Octobers and then wet winters all the way through. It is taking longer. Uh, no two ways about it. I suppose it's similar to what they say, Rome wasn't built in a day, wasn't it? That side of things really doesn't happen it is. every night. I think it also depends on your your attitude to how quickly you want to achieve uh, that end goal. I mean, you could put a huge cover crop on there um, of C4 series plants, um, sunflowers, millets, maize, and you would have a, a very, very big beneficial effect in year one. Um, and that carbon would then fire that whole process along. Um, but obviously, you know, there are, there are fields that you would want to try and crop if you if you can. Brilliant, thanks. Stephen, back to you. Um, do you think that tree rows could prov uh, could provide meaningful reduction in plant heat stress in grain filling stage in wheat in the south of England? Yeah, I I, I think you know as uh, as we start to see more extremes of of weather with cli you know climate impacts, I think there's a there's a real case for it. Certainly, you know, in the in the two fairly dry spring summers we've had in the last couple of years we've had bread of grain fill um, and and higher yields adjacent to the trees compared to sort of the middle parts of the fields I mean, it's it's partly down to that evaporation evapotranspiration partly down to a bit of shading um and partly down to actually i think a bit of hydraulic lift so that the deeper rooting of the deeper roots of the trees actually bring up some moisture to near the near the soil surface and some of that can be exploited by the, the shallow rooting uh, of crop roots. So that there's a, you know, those interactions of mycorrhizae as well to the plant roots uh, actually help, help with that uh, moisture transport. And that all aids with grain fill. You know, crop, crops under stress don't fill as well. Mm. And moving on, um, I've got a question here about uh, drainage. Um, mm -hmm. How does agroforestry affect fields that have been drained? So uh, that was the one question... Uh, my landlord asked me when I asked him if I could plant a lot of trees. <laughs> uh, and I managed to find a very good piece of work actually from, from the University of Guelph in Canada. And it, and it, it actually makes a, you know, it, it's a sort of straightforward answer in that it's all about drain maintenance. Um, it, the, you, the first thing is you wouldn't plant perhaps willow uh, on fields which have lots of tile drain because they have a high demand for moisture. But ultimately, if you maintain the drains uh, so that they're flowing and they're clear, in the winter, the trees are dormant and they're shut down and they're not looking for moisture um, and the drains will run. In the summer, however, uh, when, the, when, the, when the trees are seeking moisture, those drains should be empty uh, and there shouldn't be water flowing. And if the drains are maintained, the status quo is... is yeah, equilibrated. But if you if your drains are ponding moisture because they haven't been maintained in the summer, then the tree roots are going to try and find that. So it's all about good drain management, jetting, rodding, and drain maintenance. If they're if they're clear, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. And a, a quick one, um, if you can, a yes or no on this one, um, near enough or as close as you can. Um, it comes down to nitrogen, nitrogen use efficiency, which you did sort of touch on. Mm -hmm. um, do you think RB209 recommendations could be reduced as it accounts for nutrient losses? Um, I, I actually think my own personal view is that RB209 has been designed for, you know, a cultivated base system um, and it would need a, a fundamental rework or does need a fundamental rework to start thinking about cover crops companion planting agroforestry etc because the rules don't apply there are there's something there that will take nutrients up well that's exact that's what i wanted thank you thanks for that um jake i'm going to quickly come back to you before we finish okay uh, before we round up 
can go to summary. Um, Jake, there's a question about species that you're using and crop diversity uh, with your cover crops. What in what is your opinion on the level of cover crop diversity? Two, three species well chosen versus eight to ten species of mixes. I suppose it comes down to cost as well on this. Yeah, I think cost cost is an important factor. Um, as I said in my, in my talk, that depending on how long that cover crop is going to be in situ um, would depend on how much you want to spend on it. But for me, diversity is key. So I would try and go 8, 10, 15, 16 different species or varieties, because I think we, we've still got a lot to learn about the, the interaction of different varieties um, within that uh, cover crop. But certainly sort of the more the merrier in terms of, you know, different rooting strategies, whether it's compaction removal, tillage creation, or not tillage, but tilth creation, um, feeding mycorrhizal fungi, uh, all those different things. So the other thing to remember is if, you know, if you hit a dry spell and you've got a two, two or three way mix, um, you know, two of those species might not actually like that soil that year or that, those conditions that year. So you end up with a single species. Whereas if you've got eight or 10, you know, two drop off, well, okay, you've still got, you know, another eight or six to, uh, to be able to play with. So one uh, one sorry. thing Paul, that, uh, that, that actually is a, got, is a common thread through everything that Jake and I have talked about is risk, the word risk. It's about trying to de-risk the businesses and cope with those, the, you know, those extremes in, in all, whether it's business or climate. So everything we've talked about it helps with actually risk minimization, I think. Mm, I think you're right, dead right. Um, last question to you, Jake, um, before we move, move on to summary and rounding up. Um, with your mixed millen wheat species, are you able to market them as a mixed variety? Um, I don't know. I'll let you know uh, this time next year. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm sure we will find a home for it. Brilliant. Um, what we what we do we we'll go for summary. Thanks, guys. Um, really interesting. I'm just afraid we've got more questions here. I'm sorry we haven't got through them, but as I said, hopefully I'll get you to answer them afterwards, and uh, we'll put we'll publish them as well, um, so people can uh, see the answers that you give. Um, so if we want to uh, just move on. Um, so finally, just before um, I sort of round up, I just want to sum up everything that's been looked at and uh, talked about. And I think, um, you know, we have, as, as you've seen, by being open to some blue sky thinking, you can ensure these challenges open the door to create beneficial opportunities. I therefore place a further challenge to you as agronomists. Think outside your usual box and also encourage farmers to work with to work with with you um, to work to be innovative. So with your assistance, they can make opportunities that sustainably plant a profit. So with that and before I wrap up, um, I just uh, see that um, we can go on a slide. On that, um, I see that. Uh, uh, before I thank everyone, I see that the basis and the Rosso codes are up. So please take them down for basis. It's B23A and the Rosso is the code is N23A. You can go over to your left hand side. There should be um, and find the um, relatable uh, link to that and uh, click on that and uh, you add your code in um, and then you can actually claim those points. Um, Finally, uh, there's a few other things. This is the last um, cereals focus meeting. As tomorrow, the focus is turning to, to potatoes uh, with the first meeting starting at 9 a.m. Um, and it's going to be looking at how to get the best out of potatoes, its markets, agronomy and the industry. Um, I would uh, also, uh, just before I go, just like to uh, thank the speakers. Um, very much uh, thanks to Steve and Jake um, and uh, also for the people in the background, uh, Aaron Newman and uh, Fiona Geary as well, who are in the background uh, keeping things in check. Um, and lastly, um, uh, there's uh, just before I go as well, just if you can scroll down and there's a uh, meet it, there's a, there's a form that you can actually fill in um, to give your 
uh, just your thoughts on the meeting um, and your reactions and any thoughts that we can take forward to do in future presentations uh, or webinars, uh, if you can fill that in. Um, so finally, I'd just like to thank everyone who turned up to this session. Um, until we meet again, good night and keep safe.